Active Training Systems. Uh, so, this is kind of the last of our prepared presentations, but it's one that I'm also really excited to talk to you guys about. Um, planning and programming is, is something that I'm really interested in. That's a kind of what I like to tinker with probably the most. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today are some, some kind of deep underlying problems with traditional planning methods. And what I've done and what I've learned as far as working around those problems and how it's kind of led to some unique solutions and frankly how it's led to a lot better results for our athletes. And uh, so we're going to just kind of jump into this thing. Um, first off, this may come as a surprise to some, but periodization has problems. It's not a perfect solution to our planning, training and planning needs. So. Um, what I'm referring to here are the more established periodization models. So think of things like block periodization and undulating periodization and linear periodization and all the other, uh, I guess, smorgasbord of vocabulary words that you've learned to describe different ways of doing the training planning. Uh, there's some issues with it in terms of, there's, a, there's really just kind of a lack of long-term clarity. And we'll talk about annual multi-year planning, but it's this, vague amorphous thing you know that we acknowledge exists but we have difficulty wrestling with and things like that and um, <clears throat> then there are some clear deficiencies within each uh, with, within each uh, specific training model itself um, we can talk about what some of those deficiencies are specifically but it really varies depending on which one you're talking about, and I think you kind of need to, to deep dive into each periodization model to, to explore those, but uh, suffice to say that there are deficiencies. None of them are perfect. But the thing that we kind of come back to is like, it's all supported by science, right? Like we've, we've done the studies, we know that this method is superior than this other method. Well, maybe not as much as you think. So if you look at the periodization science, uh, you'll notice some, some very clear problems, okay? Uh, first off, a lot of them, a lot of the uh, studies on different periodization models are done with comparison protocols. So you have a group of 18 rugby players and uh, they have a training status, right? Because we don't like studies that are done on untrained people. They have a training status and they have a training history and then we're going to take half of them and put them on this other periodization model uh, that we've uh, Come up and we're, we're really kind of thinking in the back of our mind that that's the superior model uh, So we've got half of them that are still doing what they've always done and the other half are doing this new thing and then the half that are doing the new thing uh, Get better results. Well, did we prove that this program has better results or? Did we just prove that, hey, it's a novel training stimulus? You know, we, so we measured this thing. Does it measure what we really think it measures? You know, and of course there are ways around that, but um, those ways don't get tackled as often as you would hope. Um, also, most of the studies done on periodization are short term. So what's a, just to kind of see who's, who, like what you guys think, I guess. Um, what would be an example of a, of a training study that would be long-term? What's a long-term training study? I just, I just have a question. What do you mean by training? <clears throat> Can you give us like a... Sure. So, sure. So I'm talking about the way that you go about planning training. Okay. So uh, the, the, the basic model that you use for planning training. So uh, you start with high volume and low intensity, and then as you progress toward the meet, the intensity goes up and the volume goes down. That's a classic linear periodization model. And there's a ton of different ways to go about doing it. Um, so what would be an example of like a long-term training study? Something that's, that's fairly long-term. Yeah. I would say like six months or more. Well, that would be nice, but I don't think any, I, I don't know of any training studies oh, that have, what, have been done for six months or more. Are you asking what they consider like yeah, like what would be an example, like you read a study and you say, man, that's a long training period. Maybe 12 weeks, something like that, you know? 
So it doesn't, doesn't matter specifically, but the point is that if, even if you look at a study and even if there was a study that was six months, like that's not long term in terms of like an athlete's career, you know, so there's a, a short term bias. And the longer the study gets, the more difficult it gets to control, the more difficult it gets to recruit participants. And it just gets a lot harder, you know, so the, a lot of studies are biased toward a shorter time frame. And it makes sense and it's for good reasons, but when it comes to extrapolating what's going to be best for us as athletes over the long term, that's got some pretty significant limitations. Also, it's all group based. Uh, now, I talked about this yesterday when I was talking about the, the personality interventions. That was also group based. We're looking at population averages and deviations from those averages. You know, that's kind of how it's got to be done a bit. but. Uh, it's, it's sometimes useful, but for answers for you as an individual, that's not prescriptive. You know, you can't say because this is the average, therefore I need to do it this way as well. Because raise your hand if you're exactly average. Right. Nobody. Right. So the, the average problem is it's a problem. Right. Uh, and there are big variations around the mean. So yesterday we found that uh, let's see. So among the higher level lifters that we, uh, that we talked about, the average conscientiousness was in the 65th percentile, but the range for each individual went from one to 99. Okay. So there's a huge range <clears throat> and that's going to be important for that individual. Lots of, uh, studies are done on untrained subjects, which also po poses a problem, but even if they're not done on untrained subjects, what is considered to be a trained subject is not very well trained, you know? So that's a problem as well. Uh, then there are the more generic science problems, uh, lack of replication, lack of negative publications and so on and so on. And the biggest problem is over concluding. So I have a quote up here that I want to read to you. Um, I'm not, does anyone know who John Kiley is? You know, a bit, uh, he's written a bit about periodization and some critiques of periodization that I think are really, really insightful. So I have a quote here from an article that he wrote, um, about periodization science. And it says, in a sense, trying to piece together a comprehensive periodized philosophy using available evidence is like looking through a keyhole and trying to describe the outside world. We get imperfect and incomplete, potentially misleading snapshots, but that since these are all we have, the overriding temptation is to construct a grand all encompassing philosophy around woefully incomplete information. <clears throat> and now I want to talk about, you know, speed up a little bit here, but I want to talk about the logical roots of periodization. So periodization as we know it now and the current training models and stuff that we have now, the way that we plan training, uh, has its roots in the Soviet union. And, it came about there because as they're uh, imposing these top-down uh, political structures, uh, they're, they apply a top-down planning system to farming, they apply a top-down planning system to every aspect of society, and sport training was no different. So since there uh, is this top-down planning paradigm that gets applied to sports, and since they we're good at sports. The assumption is that that's the best way to do it. So the, the issue is that you're dealing with a human being and a human being is a complex system. And what I mean by that is that you have, uh, you, you give an input and you give input a, you get output B. Okay. But with a human, you get a complex system. So this time, I, I give you input A, I tell you to squat three sets, and you get output B, your squat goes up. The next time I tell you to squat three sets, and you get a different output. Maybe your squat doesn't go up, or maybe it goes down, or maybe you get some other sort of effect. So you get these, um, these nonlinear effects, uh, and to try to shoehorn a complex system into a top-down planning model things get jammed up and things don't work quite as well as they ought to. And that's fine if you're running a national team and you can just take in a thousand athletes and grind them through your system and you can spit out a handful of champions that fit that system just perfectly. But that's not any of our situation. 
you have one athlete, and you're trying to get the best results possible. <clears throat> Your body's not a washing machine. Uh, who's heard the statement, food is fuel? Okay, food's not fuel. It's, that's part of what it is, but it's also a social experience. It's also many other things. And if you treat it as only one thing, you're kind of treating your body like a washing machine. And you're a lot more complicated than that. You're, you get these nonlinear effects that we were talking about. And if you only treat it as, as fuel, you get weird outputs, okay? So that's why it's important to at least consider more of the complexity of what you're dealing with. <clears throat> then there's the whole issue with debating optimal periodization methods and stuff like that, block periodization being superior to linear periodization and blah, 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 blah. And I've participated in a lot of that before, right? But there's a problem that comes about with it. Uh, a lot of these are much more similar than different. Um, if you, so I mentioned block periodization and linear periodization. These are two different schools of thought and, and they have like strong adherence on both sides of this, right? Uh, you know, block periodization is superior to linear periodization because Ishran says so and all this stuff. And, and, but if you look at what you get when you do the planning, they're very similar. It, it, but I mean, you try to tell that to one of the advocates of, of any of these planning models and you know they get pretty irritated by that uh, and a lot of the uh, animosity between these different groups comes from interpersonal conflict uh, because the founder of this school didn't like the founder of that school and and stuff like that <clears throat> and then there's the question that I talked about earlier when we were talking about the the problems of uh, are we measuring what we think we measure there's the issue that maybe it's a change in the stimulus itself that's causing the adaptation. So I always have to caveat stuff like this with what I'm not saying. I'm not saying science is bad. I'm not saying periodization is bad. I'm saying our assumptions are bad. I'm saying let's at least consider those, at least reconsider those, and see if maybe we could be doing things a bit differently or maybe we should be doing things a bit better. So let's, let's think those through. So... If we kind of start with that framework in mind, where do we go from here? I don't think the issue is with how training's organized, uh, but it's more about how you manage it. Everybody knows that the plan's gonna break. You start off with a training plan, and you know that it's, that's not what you're gonna stick to. You know? And we talk about RPE training, we talk about these different tools that are more flexible. We know that the plan is gonna break, so, it's not so much if, but when, and then what are you going to do about it? The plan has to adapt to emerging information. Um, as you learn more about yourself, as you learn more about how you're responding to different training stimulus, you've got to adapt and change and move. Um, and what I'm going to talk about next, the emerging strategies, is a framework for how to think about that. It's a framework for how to deal with this emerging information and how to be more agile, basically. Um, but you may ask, can't we still use these periodization concepts that I so love and uh, focus on the emerging information at the same time? Well, maybe you can, but that's doubtful. And the reason is because uh, in a lot of cases, systems drive behavior. And if you're in a system that doesn't reward you for paying attention to emerging information, if you're in a system that doesn't, doesn't encourage you to think like that, then you're not going to think like that, or you'll be less likely to think like that. Now, we talked yesterday, I think during the Q&A, about how if you have a plan and you've planned for 12, 16 weeks, and then you're four weeks in and something goes wrong or something's off track, you're reluctant to change it, you know, because, well, you have this plan and, you know, you spent time and effort to make this plan, so you ought to stick with that, you know. Well, that's a, that's a cognitive bias. That's a, a, a tendency to do something that's not ideal for you. And that's what I'm talking about as far as like systems driving behavior. So I've got another John Kiley quote here for you. And it says, but crucially, when we, look at, when we look back on what's been written about periodization, and especially when we look at the most widely read publications and theorists, it's the plan that's promoted. It's the plan that's debated. It's the plan that's persistently highlighted. Whereas the process 
the need for the coach to be turned on to, to excuse me tuned in and alert the need for the coach to be a creative problem solver the need for the coach to be responsive to emerging challenges and the need for the coach to nurture athlete education and the need for the coach to be sensitive to weak signals heralding growing risks and vulnerabilities is persistently undervalued so how do you solve these problems and as I was thinking about this, like, okay, so we've got these problems and, and these sorts of issues, so what do I do about it? Well, I kind of had a thought, like, how would I train if I'd never heard of periodization? What would I do then? Well, if you never heard of any of this, if you don't know that, well, next week is supposed to be a little bit higher intensity than this week, and so on and on, if you never knew that, what would you do? Well, I thought back to how I trained in the very beginning when I didn't know any of that and I thought well I just kind of went to the gym and I did a thing and if it worked it kind of kept doing it and then when it stopped working I started doing something different you know okay maybe that's not so bad like let's let's play with that idea a little bit more okay basically we're talking about having this complex system and instead of answering that complex system with more complexity in these complex models and interlocking cycles and all this stuff what if we simplify it what if we answer complexity with simplicity instead of more complexity? So let's remove, how do we do that, okay? Let's remove as many variables as we can and simplify the training process. We'll be able to more accurately assess what works and what doesn't, and instead of using a top-down pr planning process, we'll use a bottom-up planning process. Whoa, what does that look like? And that's where I got stuck for a long time. <clears throat> But I finally talked to some smart people. Uh, does anyone know uh, Dr. Anatoly Bondarchuk? Two? Yeah. He's uh, probably the most successful, maybe the most successful coach ever, but definitely the most successful throws coach in terms of number of Olympic gold medals. And he was a gold medalist himself. Um, anyway, in the early 2000s, he came to Canada and uh, was coaching up there. And a lot of, so he's written a lot and his writing is tough to decipher. Uh, but he worked with uh, some Canadian coaches and they learned his system and got to see, like learn by doing, see what he actually does, you know. And so I've talked to, uh, one of those coaches is um, uh, Derek Evely and he helped me piece a lot of this stuff together. And also uh, Martin Bissinger uh, who trained under Bondarchuk and so a lot of these ideas start with Bondarchuk's ideas on how to train throwers. And that's a bottom-up system. And that's, when I heard about it, I was like, light bulb, that's how you would do it. That's a bottom-up system. If you were going to figure out how to implement this in a powerlifting uh, setting, you would basically do something that looks kind of like that. Okay, so what does that look like? It's what I'm calling the emerging strategy because like I said, it's a bottom-up system. It's, you're allowing the long-term plan to emerge from the short-term plan. We're gonna take that short-term plan, we're gonna do what works, and we're gonna keep doing it for as long as it's working. And when it stops working, we're gonna do something else. And we're gonna learn about you and how you adapt and how you respond to the training stimulus. We're gonna figure this stuff out as we go and we're gonna get better as we go, okay? So the framework for a bottom-up approach is we're gonna remove as many assumptions as we can. And we're going to use uh, systems to monitor your training. Uh, so think of really so that all these web tools that we've been developing have been in large part a response to this. Okay, so things like the training log have been specially designed to fit into this framework because we use it as coaches. Things like track uh, that we use to monitor uh, training and recovery have been designed to to help us answer these questions okay we want to monitor the athlete how are they how are they adapting to the training how are they recovering from the training things like that and then we're going to use contingency planning to have a plan in place to deal with emerging information what happens if we're two weeks out and all of a sudden it looks like the athlete's peaking too early well, let's have a contingency plan for this stuff. We don't have to set it all out in advance because if we have this long-term plan and things don't go according to it, then there's that, that tendency to, to hold on to the plan for too long. So we don't need that long-term plan so much as we need contingencies and, and adaptability and flexibility to respond to these changes in this emerging information. Okay, uh, what happens if we have a non-response to a cycle or something like that? Um, and then we get fairly uninterested in long-term planning. 
um, at least until you know the athlete quite well. Because what we have to do first is improve the short term. First, we're going to improve this cycle. Then we're going to focus on a little bit longer time frame. And then if we get really good at putting together successful training cycles, then we'll try to put together two training cycles. And then we'll try to put together three training cycles. And if we can do that, then we're getting a pretty, pretty good long-term plan established anyway. So we let those things emerge from the short term. <clears throat> so I want to compare and contrast just real quickly here the top down, the bottom up approach. The top-down approach uses prediction models. Uh, it plans training far in advance. Um, there's not much emphasis on contingency situations because, hey, we have a plan, right? Um, it requires minimal monitoring. And there's infinite variations, but there's a finite number of different planning models. So it simplifies our decision-making a bit because there's this model to follow. The bottom-up approach makes minimal predictions. It keeps planning durations very short. It uh, has a heavy emphasis on emerging information, it requires extensive monitoring, and it requires uh, an emphasis on small cycles, so the variations are infinite, and in some cases that can be a little bit overwhelming. So we talked about problems of periodization. How does this bottom-up approach solve those problems? Basically, it doesn't apply a heavy emphasis on periodization science, because that's not really part of the system. It ignores Soviet planning constructions, uh, it implements a process-focused approach instead of a planning-focused approach. And uh, there's contingencies in place to deal with those emerging information situations. But all tools have weaknesses, right? So I'm kind of starting to lay out a framework here, but I, up front I want to be honest with you and say this isn't perfect, okay? So there's definitely some weaknesses to, to go in this way. And some of those weaknesses are it requires extensive monitoring and coaching attention. If you are a coach and you can't pay attention to your athletes that much, if you can't develop a relationship with your athletes, this is not the way to go. Okay? If, uh, it also requires good record keeping. If you're an athlete and you don't log your training, this is not the way to go. Don't do it. Uh, if uh, all the variations, all the possibilities can be a bit overwhelming. Because what are we going to do in the next block? Well, you could do just about anything. You know, and at least until you start to get an idea of what the athlete responds to. And that's a lot of possibility. So that can be a bit overwhelming unless you have a pretty good idea of what, what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And then there's an emphasis on coaching knowledge. Since you have basically all the tools at your disposal, and you can use any of them, you have to be knowledgeable enough to know which tool to use. So I want to review what we talked about so far before I get into the next part. We talked about problems with periodization, and I'm going to have some questions, so whoever's got the mic. Um, we talked about problems with periodization uh, and how to solve those problems, strengths and weaknesses of the bottom-up approach, what I'm not saying, uh, focus, uh, that we're going to try to focus on the method. Um, we also talked about uh, defining what the, emerging, what the emerging strategy is and the top-down versus bottom-up. So some questions for you guys real quick. What's your reaction to this? I mean, I think some people are maybe confused. Probably a lot of people are confused, but uh, because I haven't really said much so far except for criticizing periodization. But do you have any sort of emotional reaction to this? Yeah. I think it makes sense, and I think it's like intuitive with working with an individual athlete, but it also leaves a lot of questions of like, even when you peel back all the layers, what is the base plan that you're starting with? Like, I guess yeah. that's the big question mark for me is like, there has to be some yeah. bottom of the pyramid. Sure, sure. So one thing that happens, uh, so I'm talking about this top-down approach, right? So we have this top-down approach and we see that, hey, that doesn't work quite so well because I can't predict where you'll be 12 weeks from now. Uh, so we start planning shorter and shorter training cycles until we're like, well, you should never plan more than three or four weeks in advance anyway. Well, maybe. But maybe not, you know. So we, we still have this top-down approach, but it's got these little feedback loops, you know. What I'm talking about is kind of turning that on its head. So it's a bottom-up approach, but little feed-forward loops, you know. So instead of, we, we kind of know vaguely where we want to go. Like I can tell, hey, there's a competition that's four months from now, and, and I know that that's where we're going. Uh, so we can tweak things as we go, but really we're letting that plan emerge. But yeah, 
good observation. I, hopefully we'll get those questions answered here in a second. Um, <clears throat> any thoughts that you want to challenge to this? So like I'm kind of slaying some sacred periodization cows. Anything that you want to say, hey, you're wrong about that. Just want to give you the opportunity if you care to care to voice those concerns, then that's fine. Yeah. Low agreeableness right here. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> this isn't necessarily something that's like like going against what you're saying, but but I almost see this also as something like like similar to periodization in a way. It's just that you haven't planned far in advance. Like the specificity of what you're doing of like for this board of powerlifting, like rep ranges, volume, intensity, uh, the lifts that you're doing, the variations that you're doing are still very much similar as what any other periodization scheme would do. It's just that how you're planning it in the length of time that you're doing is just going to be based on what's happening in the now instead of what you predict might happen 12 weeks from now. Yes and no. So um, and we'll get more into the, maybe I should stop asking questions and start talking, right? But uh, yes and no, but I think we'll get more into like how that's going to play out. But if we define periodization as a way of planning training, then yeah, this is definitely a periodization scheme. It's a different periodization model, but I think it's something that relies a lot more on the emergence of information and we're not going to over plan the thing. Okay. So let me, let me share a bit more about what I'm, what I am saying. <clears throat> so we've talked about so far some problems with the top down planning model, some pros and cons of the bottom up, and we want to solve problems of complexity with more simplicity. So let's get a bit more practical here. So I say we need to simplify things. How do we want to do that? Like, the first thing would be, don't change the training stimulus. We end up changing the training stimulus all the time. So let's stop doing that. Basically, we start with building a training microcycle. Okay, so that would be a training week. In, in most cases, it's going to be a training week. And this is going to form the base of your development cycle. Okay, um, you basically have a week of training. So I have listed here on the screen uh, a, a week's worth of training. And this is from an actual development cycle that I was doing in October of 2016. Um, you can see it's a week's worth of training. And I did that training week. And the next week, I did it again. And the next week, I did it again, and then I did it again. It's the same training week over and over. The only thing that changes, the weights will change a little bit so that I can stick to those RPE uh, objectives. So the weights fluctuate a bit, and hopefully you're trending up as I'm getting stronger. But it's the same reps, it's the same intensities, it's the same exercises, it's the same structure of the training week. Everything is pretty much the same. Okay. Now, what I'm doing during that time is monitoring my training results. Okay, so you're repeating the training week, you're monitoring your training results. Now results are going to improve, but they're only going to improve up to a point, right? So just because you improved last week doesn't mean that you're absolutely going to improve this week, although you could. So that's going to improve up to a point and then you won't improve any further. Now that point is your peak condition. Okay. Now achieving a real peak condition is important. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but achieving a real peak is important. And we're going to measure how long it takes you to, to go from the start of the training cycle into that peak condition. And that's known as your time to peak. Now your time to peak is going to be fairly stable unless you start changing a lot of really crazy stuff uh, between development cycles. But if your development cycles are of of similar training strategy, then your time to peak is going to be fairly stable. So I know that for me, my time to peak, if I'm doing one microcycle for each week, is about six weeks. And I know Rory is four weeks. So it varies from person to person, but it's fairly stable. Okay. <clears throat> So what you do is in the first training block that you're, you're doing, you don't know what your time to peak is. So you have to take it a bit too far. All right. So you can see in these graphs here. So we've got a squat, a bench press and a deadlift. These are estimated one RMs from the training session. 
And we can see that results improve and results improve, but then at some point they stop improving. And it's pretty obvious to look at this and see where those peak conditions happen. So then you see how long did, how long did it take? So it turns out each of these data points is one week because it's one microcycle per week. So you just count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, six weeks. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. So five weeks on the squat, six for the bench and the deadlift. It's one of the weird things that just kind of happened and I can't, I can't really explain to you why. It's pretty much similar across all your lifts, okay? There may be some slight variations, you know, one lift might peak a week earlier or a week later than the others, but you can treat them as roughly the same, okay? So for a person like this, we would probably uh, we would probably peak them in five weeks, maybe six weeks, depending on how things were progressing overall. <clears throat> now, there are some different patterns that you're going to see as you do this. Okay, there's type one, two, and three. So type one, which you see here on the left side, they basically just improve. It's good to be these people. You put them on a development cycle and they just kind of get better until they hit that peak condition. You know, each week is a little bit better, a little bit better. And this is a really nice pattern. You see that there's a big jump and a small jump, a big jump and a small jump, a big jump, and then that's a peak. So if you know that about the person, that's really useful information. Now a type two, here we're looking between these yellow dots, okay? The yellow dot on the left is, uh, or the yellow highlighted dot rather, on the left is the start of the development cycle and the one on the right is the end of the development cycle. So you can see that at the start, there was a dip in performance and then a consistent improvement all the way up to the peak condition. So that's type two. And then type three is the one on the bottom here and there's a, a, stagnant, uh, a stagnant response through most of the training block and then a jump at the end, okay? So those are the three basic response types. Most people are gonna fall into those categories. I would say most people are type one or type two. Occasionally you'll get a type three it depends a little bit on what type of training cycle that you're doing. But again, this is somewhat specific to the, to the individual who's doing the training. Now, just a real quick aside, it's kind of hard to detect a type three and that can lead you to some, some issues, right? So what we have here is a graph that, that runs out to 11 weeks or 11 microcycles. And we can see that that, that peak condition happens on the 11th, uh, the 11th week, or rather the 10th week, sorry. So the 10th microcycle, oops, the 10th microcycle is where we have the peak condition, okay? Now, think back to the beginning in week one. You don't know that the whole right side of this graph exists yet, okay? So as you're going through it, you know, week two is an improvement, week three is a down, week four is an improvement, week five is an improvement, week six is a down. So in week six, you're, you might be looking at that and thinking, oh, well, their peak condition is in week five, right? Well, maybe, but let's keep going a little bit and see what happens. Well, they improve and they improve. And it turns out that's, a, that's what we've been calling a mini peak. But there's this whole other side of the iceberg if we just kind of keep going and, and exploring. So you've got to go long enough to be certain or at least reasonably certain that you're in a peak condition. So when do you end the first development cycle? Well, when you, again, when you're fairly certain that you've uh, hit that peak condition or the athlete's feeling like they're an injury risk or something like that, then it's time to stop. So use your brain, don't hurt your lifters. You know, you wouldn't wanna push them until the point of injury. So if they're telling you like, look, this is not a good idea to keep going, then listen. But other than that, you want to make reasonably certain that you've hit that peak condition. So <clears throat> after that, when you do subsequent development cycles in the future, you don't have to go too far, okay? You know, hey, this athlete peaks in five weeks, so you can go five weeks, maybe six weeks if they're feeling good, but you don't have to go too far. You know when they're gonna peak. Um, so what do you do after a development cycle? Well, it kind of depends on what the landscape is uh, that you're dealing with. If there's a competition that's coming up real soon, then maybe you go into a maintenance phase. So you're just trying to maintain that peak until you can get to the competition and display your results. 
Uh, now, if there's no competition nearby, you would go into what we've been calling a pivot block. It's also been called a washout, a restoration, a rest cycle, a cleanse cycle. We've just been calling it a pivot block. Okay. Um, you would do that really if there's if there's no contest nearby. Okay. So, <clears throat> what's what's a restoration cycle? What's a pivot block? What it, what is that? Well, basically. You've been training the same way, you've been repeating the same microcycle over and over and over until you get to this peak condition. Now you're in a peak condition, now everything changes. You change, uh, you reduce the fatigue, um, you lower the intensity, uh, vary the workout structure, reduce the training stress. Um, so it's, it's a deload, but it's more than a deload, okay? It's, you're reducing the training stress and allowing the athlete to recover, but you're also, um, you're also doing things that enhance their adaptability for future uh, training cycles. So you've got to change the exercises. You've got to change the stimulus. You're not trying to wear those things out anymore. You're trying to let them recover and adapt. It's important to take these uh, pivot blocks seriously. So people have a tendency, lifters have a tendency that when we get to the, the deload that we go, ah, forget it, you know. Um, we make easy training too easy or we skip it uh, and it's important not to do that because there is a real training value to doing these pivot blocks. It helps you to adapt, it helps you to respond better to future development cycles, so take it seriously. So I've got another example of what a development cycle might look like. You can tell that the competition lift is still in there, uh, but the intensity is greatly reduced. All the other exercises have changed. They're highly nonspecific. Uh, there's not a lot of heavy stuff. Um, you're doing deload training, but you're also getting out of your typical movement patterns and doing things to enhance your general athleticism and things like that. So how long is a restoration cycle or, or pivot block? Well, it varies and it's kind of difficult to nail down a little bit, but we start with roughly a third of the length of the development cycle. So if your development cycle was three weeks or four weeks, then we're gonna do a one week pivot. If your development cycle was six weeks, then we'll do a two week pivot. If your development cycle was nine weeks, then we'll do a three week pivot. Um, on average, I can tell you this, on average, the development cycles that we see are between four and six weeks, um, five and six usually, uh, occasionally, well, more than occasionally. Oftentimes you'll have lifters who are you know, three, four weeks. Oftentimes you'll have lifters who are eight weeks, nine weeks. I've had someone go 10 weeks of repeating the same workouts over and over and continuing to improve for 11 weeks. Now it gets pretty unwieldy at that point in terms of being able to do agile planning. So uh, there are some things that you can do to, to manipulate that, which we'll talk about. Um, but roughly you want the pivot cycles to be a third of the length of the, of the development cycle. <clears throat> So if you do your next development cycle and you kind of don't get the response that you were looking for, then it could be that your pivot cycle was uh, too short. So maybe you want to make it a bit longer. If you, if you have a two week, um, uh, say a two week long pivot and you lose all your strength, then maybe you want to look at shortening that pivot or training a bit heavier during the pivot or something. So the idea is to ma maintain your strength on as low intensity as you can get away with and uh, with a, as little volume and, and um, specificity as you can get away with as well. So just quickly before I get into the last section, I want to review what I talked about so far. Uh, we talked about uh, designing a microcycle, designing one training week and repeating it over and over until you hit a peak condition. And that's your development cycle. And then we talked about uh, following that peak up with a restoration cycle or a pivot block. Uh, and we talked about the response types and measuring the time to peak. Okay. So again, that time to peak is fairly stable unless there's a drastic change to the overall training stress of the cycle or more commonly, unless you change the, the frequency of the training cycle. Okay. So, so far I was, I've been talking about doing one microcycle in a given week. Okay. It's one week of training that you repeat the same week over and over. Well, it doesn't have to be a week. You could, 
basically have a b workouts and then you would get through two if you did four workouts a week you would get through two microcycles in a given week and that's the example that i have here you'll look at monday and that's exactly the same workout that you do on thursday tuesday's workout is exactly the same workout that you do on friday so it's a b a b okay you're getting through two microcycles in one week of time okay now what does that do well, your time to peak is not so much about time, it's about exposures, roughly, okay? So if your actual time to peak on a 1x frequency was six weeks, and then you double that frequency, you would expect, uh, theoretically, that it would take you about half the time. It's still six exposures, but about half the time. Now, in reality, we see that that's not quite the way it works out. You know, real life is never as nice as a math problem, it seems. Uh, so in reality, the way it works out is the, your real peak will be typically more around the four week mark or something like that. So it's definitely shorter. So those people I was telling you about who takes them 11 weeks to peak, and we said that's kind of unwieldy and, and not very nice to deal with. Well, you can double the frequency and have them do a 2x microcycle frequency, and it'll take them roughly six, seven weeks to peak, which is much more manageable. <clears throat> I just want to reiterate that training in this peak condition is a rare and valuable thing. So you're training, you're repeating this the same workout week after week, and you're getting better and better and better and better. And when you get to that peak condition, Training there is, it only happens a couple times a year, okay? So if you take six weeks to peak, which we said is average, and then you do a two-week pivot block, and that's all you do, and you never take a vacation, and you never have any competitions, or you never have anything that throws off your timing, it still takes you two months to get through a cycle. So only six times a year are you training at the pinnacle of your ability. Now, think about what adds to the pinnacle of your ability like you have to get as strong as you've ever been to get a little bit stronger okay you don't go from you know being a, a, a zero to setting a pr in a couple weeks like that's a process right so you've got to get into that peak condition to get to the next level okay so it's important that you actually be able to get there so that poses a problem for people like me who peak in six weeks, if I do a training program that runs three week training blocks, well, I never really get into that peak condition, do I? You know, I'm deloading feels like all the time. And that's true because it's not tailored to my individual response. <clears throat> if you train with a low frequency, so one microcycle per week, you get fewer peaks per year, but each peak is a bit bigger. If you train with a higher frequency, you get, uh, you get more peaks per year, but each peak is a bit smaller. So the real question is, which one leads to the best long-term progress? And I don't know. It's probably an individual response. So, peaking for competition. If you have a competition that's coming up and you're trying to decide when to peak, this makes it a lot easier. Okay, you can you know this about yourself, you know that you peak in four weeks. So you know that you need to start your last development cycle so that that peak workout happens on the competition day. Okay, and now from there, you can basically train normally up to that point, because you know that it's the fourth competition workout, and that it's always the fourth workout. And if I put that fourth workout on the competition day, then I'll, I'll perform at my best, you know that about yourself. Okay, so you can just kind of work backwards from there and start and, and peak and deload and all those things as you need to to peak on the competition day because it's tailored to you. So what you'll do is train normally up to the competition. You rest for two or three days prior and there's very little taper. There's very little uh, deloading that needs to happen as you go into the meet because anything like that is going to be a deviation from what's normal to you. It, you know how you respond to training and you know that you go in this direction uh, so you don't want to you don't want to deviate from that if possible so uh, you can train up to the competition date rest two or three days prior and if nothing else that's a really good starting point to performing your best on competition day and there's individual variation that can happen after that some people do well with uh, a taper uh, other people not so much but this at least Pro provides 
uh, predictably high performance. So again, the strengths and weaknesses of, of this as a planning tool. It requires a coach who's knowledgeable and a creative problem solver. You've got to be that or else this doesn't work so well for you. It requires excellent communication between the lifter and the coach. If that's not present, we don't use this method. Uh, it requires discipline in the peak. When you're getting up to those peak conditions, especially pre-contest and anxiety is a bit higher, the tendency to go, hey, I'm kind of tired. Maybe I ought to do a taper. Maybe I ought to do a deload. No, you shouldn't because we know that you always peak in four workouts and we're just going to keep doing that because it's predictable. I've, I've had a lifter who would improve for two workouts and then regress and it was reliable. Two workouts up, one down. Two up, one down. Now think about that pattern as you go into the competition. You want the competition to be on the up workout, right? So that means two weeks out from the, work, from the competition, you have a bad workout. Okay, so think about how you feel when you're two weeks out from a meet and you're going, uh, just anyway, you're just nervous anyway. And then you have a bad workout and they go, oh no, this is not working, you know? Well, I can show them this chart and say, hey, you always do this. This is normal for you. Two up, one down, two up, one down. You're gonna be fine. And they can see it and say, oh yeah, I, I do always do that. And then predictably on the competition day, bang, peak performance. So. Having discipline in the peak is important, and that's the thing that helps this whole system to work. Um, it's easy to see what works. You, we do a thing we call block reviews. So we get lifters to log their workouts, and then we run a block review on every training block that they do. So when they're training for a big competition, say they're going to nationals or something like that, we start pulling all their block reviews, and we can see, hey, uh, what are the good training blocks that we've done? Here are the successful ones. What do they have in common? And I, for example, like for me, I know that I've been getting a lot out of things like pin press. I've uh, been getting a lot out of things like incline bench. Pause benching, not so much, but that's me. You know, Ross is in a different situation. Uh, Rory's in a different situation. Everybody's a little bit different in the things that they respond well to. What intensity zones do you respond well to? Do you like high frequency training or low frequency training? Well, it's a lot easier to see like this because we've simplified everything enough that we can start to see those patterns. Uh, we're getting rid of a lot of the noise and we can see more of the signal. <clears throat> and it's designed to capitalize on emerging information. It dies with no information. If I've got an athlete who doesn't keep a training log, then I'm just guessing. But the truth of the matter is you're just guessing anyway. It's just that other periodization models help you feel better about that guess. So, so there's that. So I want to talk real quickly uh, about a case study. So what, what did this look like as we implemented it? So I use Liz Craven. She's a favorite case study of mine pretty much all the time. So we're going to talk about her. She was actually the first person that I used this, this method on. And so she was a, a world record holder at the time and a world level competitor at the time even. And so I'm going to try this thing that I've never done before on, on somebody like that. But we talked about it and that was what we decided to do. Um, the thing is, like when you think about it, it shouldn't be that big of a deal, right? Like, hey, we're going to give you this thing and we're going to see how you do with it. And we're just going to keep doing it for as long as it works. But when it stops working, we're going to do something diff different. OK, I mean, that doesn't sound too crazy, right? When you put it like that. So what we ended up doing with her, uh, it's a bit hard to read for you guys here, I think. But um, it's a 2x microcycle frequency. So it's the ABAB -A -B, uh, setup. We gave this program to her and she's a type, a, a type one responder and her squat just got better and uh, her bench got better, her deadlift got better. So here around the, um, well, I think this is uh, six weeks to peak. I think this was six weeks to peak if I'm uh, remembering correctly. And I think around week four, the, so all these uh, A workouts require a single at an 8 RPE. Now think about single at an 8 RPE as being a little bit heavier than your opener, right? So around week four, she's handling weights 
for a single at an 8 RPE in training that were world records at the time. And I started going, oh man. <laughs> like, and I'm, I'm wondering at that point, should we cut this cycle a bit early? Because you don't want to get someone like that hurt. And I've never done this before and I don't really know what I'm doing and I'm just kind of figuring this out as I go. And we talked about it and decided, let's let it ride for a while and see what happens. And it's a good thing we did because at week four, it looked like things were slowing down, right? The bench was down a little bit, the, the deadlift was down a little bit, squat kind of plateaued. We kept going and bang, there were a big peak if we just went a bit further, okay? So it worked and it worked really well. And we kept doing that for a year. Um, and actually, this is a picture of Liz and, uh, and Jess Benedetto, who also did this method. This was the 2016 World Championships, uh, where they both were bronze medalists. And then this year at the World Championships, Liz was a silver medalist. Uh, she's set a bunch of open world records and whatnot since then, uh, and has <laughs> earned her spot as, as being like the favorite case study of mine, I guess. But uh, she's an excellent lifter and an incredibly hard worker. And her ability to tolerate work and to tolerate volume is like 150% of what a normal person's is. And I, and I mean that literally. <laughs> uh, we've measured it. <laughs> <clears throat> So just to review what I talked about so far, um, we talked about microcycle frequencies, basic peaking strategies, strengths and weaknesses of this method, and we talked about a case study. So some questions for you guys. Um, do you feel like this as a method is set up more for short-term gains or more for long-term gains? Long-term gains. That's what I thought too, right? And, and I think in principle it is. but. What I've observed from doing it is that the first cycle that I put somebody on is, is like magic. I, and that sounds really stupid to say out loud, but I, I don't know. It, it, it's how it seems. Like Mark can attest to that. He, the first time that he did it, he was like, what the heck is this about? You know? And I recently started working with, with uh, Dennis Cornelius. And in the first development cycle that he did, he did his 900 pound raw squat in his, in his garage, right? Now, I can't claim credit for that because it's not like I'm a programming genius and just I knew the thing that was gonna work. That was our first development cycle. Like I don't have any real great training block reviews to pull for him and it's not like, oh, I know the thing that he responds best to, but for whatever reason, he responded to that and, and it produced a big result for him. Um, so yeah, I mean, yes, long-term, but we see a lot of short-term progress too, which I guess makes sense if you think about it because the long-term is built on the short-term. So another question for you guys, what role do you see long-term planning taking as you implement a strategy like this? Like, so what do you do in terms of long-term planning? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I'd imagine even though we're all different, we're all not that different and there's probably like archetypes of certain people who certain things tend to work for and as you get a history you would be able to build something that way yeah yeah i think i think you're right about that um i think that takes a while to start to figure that out but yeah i think you're right i think as you build up your coaching experience then there's less trial and error to be done yeah um it also leads to some pretty unique solutions. So uh, I've been talking a lot lately about a lifter of mine, uh, Mike Garazzo. Um, now I've worked with Mike for a lot of years and he started working with me before, uh, before this was a thing. And one thing we've noticed is his strength would improve, and, but it would always fizzle uh, when we get close to a competition. It, we never kind of had that, ah, you know, that kind of peak that you always want, you know? And we couldn't figure out what was going on with it. But then when we started using this strategy, we figured it out. It's like, ah, it's every time we hit high intensities. It's the high intensities. That's the correlation. So whenever we're on like this middle intensity range, you know, four, five, six reps even, really six reps, he responds great. He gets a lot stronger, you know. But then we get close to competition and we start doing heavy triples and, and it's just, Pfft. so let's stop doing that. <laughs> 
You know, like, hey, this thing hurts. It hurts when I do this. We'll stop doing that, right? So we send him into a competition having done nothing heavier than six reps at a nine RPE, which is kind of scary when it comes to um, attempt selection because you haven't handled the heavier weights. And it's definitely unorthodox, but it resulted in a big improvement and some big PRs for him. Now, one thing that we did going into nationals, instead of doubling the frequency, we halved the frequency. And that, gave us, that stretched things out and gave us more slots to play with. So we could do like heavy work every other week. And that slowed things down enough that he got, I think, two exposures to heavier, uh, to heavier weights. So that was enough that we could make sense of the attempt selection thing, but not so much that it beat him up and, and tanked his results. And then the bulk of his training was spent on those middle intensity zones where he responds best. I never would have seen that. I never would have figured that out if we hadn't simplified things and slowed it down enough for those patterns to become more obvious. So that's what I've got for this presentation, and I know it went uh, quite a bit long here, but if you guys have any questions, I'd be interested in hearing those. Yeah, yep. yeah. okay. Hey, uh, so from the internet, uh, John Garofano asks, uh, do you run introduction cycles when you start a development block to to induce the repeated bout effect, or do you just jump right in? Most people that we work with uh, are trained. You know, uh, if they came to us and were, you know, coming off of a, a long training break, then yeah, we would probably do a, a, an introduction cycle. But for the most part, they've been training anyway. Maybe they've done a, a short deload, which would function as their pivot block anyway. So. I don't find a need for me personally to do an introduction block most of the time. Um, you could, you certainly could. That wouldn't be a problem. Any other questions? Yeah. So, basically, with, with this method, you're doing the same workout week to week until it stops working. So, I guess my question is: is um, are you doing just the same RPE every workout for every set? Yeah. So it's the same protocol. So I'll tell you to squat to a triple at a nine RPE, you know, and it'll be that every week, squat to a triple at a nine RPE. Now, as you get stronger, the weight will get a bit heavier, you know, but it, it's a small adjustment as you go forward, but it's to keep that, that RPE on target. Yeah. So another thing that I was really worried in the beginning that this would be boring, right? Like, man, it's just the same thing over and over. People are not going to like this. Well, I've had zero problem with boredom. And it seems like as you're doing this and as those weights are going up and getting better every week, it's not boring. Now, when you hit that peak condition and now things are, you're doing the same thing you've been doing for eight weeks and now the weights aren't improving anymore, now it's suddenly boring. But it's also time to change stuff so it's, it works out. It's not a problem. Hi, I see a lot of similarities to block periodization but with an RPE approach and more flexible because you're using data from your athletes. But uh, I do not see you talking about anything related to hypertrophy because I think that's a big thing when you do uh, block uh, periodization. Can you talk a little bit about it? So the long-term planning for this can start to look more like block periodization, but only really once you know the athlete a bit more. As If you know hey, they are, take four weeks to peak and one week pivots, and I'm 15 weeks out from the competition. Well, you know that you've got three full training cycles before you can get to the competition. Well, uh, in a case like that, maybe you set it up so that your early cycle is lower in intensity and then it goes up a little bit and up a little bit, but only if that corresponds to the athlete response. You can also, uh, we've done this with a lot of our athletes, run hypertrophy blocks if they're far away from competition and you're basically looking for a, uh, somewhat of an off-season type of thing, and that seems to work really well. But uh, you don't have to go about that. Uh, you don't have to go about it that way, and it's 100% contingent on what the athlete responds best to. I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering when you find something that works, like you start, you start this thing and you, it's a combination of things, how do you know what it is that's actually working or does that not matter because it's the whole picture that's working? Well, both. Okay. So it's kind of a, I, I guess kind of a Bayesian approach to it. So 
uh, like for example, I said for me, uh, pin presses seem to work well. How do I know that? Well, as I do these training blocks, uh, let's say I do a training block and it contains pin press and it, it, and it does well. Okay, well, that's a vote for pin press. And then I do another training block with pin press and it also does well. So I can be a little bit more sure that it's pin press, you know, because the blocks are all different, you know, but this one had high intensity and this one had low intensity. And you know. so as you go forward, you basically say, you, you develop this picture that's like, man, every time I do pin press, it goes well. Uh, every time I train for me with high intensities, it goes well. Every time Mike Carrazzo trains with high intensities, it doesn't go so well. So it's, you're never certain, okay? But you get more certain with more data. Yes. So you're saying like, you know, someone works with high intensity, someone works with a lower intensity. Like, how do you plan out different blocks? Like, do you just keep hammering high intensity forever? with that person or do you have to mix it up at times? Uh, you will want to mix it up and try different things. So if you look at, at these guys who are, say the, these masters lifters who are still setting the world on fire, you know, and you look at the training for a lot of them, uh, let's take Dave Ricks as an example. If you talk to him about the training, it's the same training that he's ran since like 1986. It's just the same thing over and over. Well, I do three weeks of sixes, three weeks of fours, three weeks of triples, and then the meet. Like it's the same thing, you know? So, and I see that a lot. It's these guys, they found the thing that works for them and they just keep doing that. And also there's, I'm sure there's some genetic predisposition to really uh, thrive on one method for a long period of time. But it's in principle, the same thing with what we're trying to do here. If you know that, Hey, this type of training cycle works best for me. Well, what if we can figure out two different types of training cycles that you respond well to, or even better would be three. Then we can just kind of go between them and you get long-term results that way. Otherwise you are left trying to explore a bit more, until you can gather up those, you know, two, three, four, two or three would be nice. And that's usually where you're at. Two or three different types of training block uh, that work well for a particular athlete. So that's what you're kind of shooting for. We'll take one more and then we'll have to give you guys a break. Just for the individual lifter, you know, what uh, steps, what advice do you give for steps that you can take to have a better understanding about what does and doesn't work? Um, whether you're working with the coach or not. The absolute best thing that you can do is to keep a good training log. And so I heard that when I was a young lifter and so I kept a notebook and I wrote down everything I did and I still have all those and I don't make any use of that. The important thing is to extract the information. So that's, and I know plugging the, the RTS training log again, but it's there for anybody to use for free. Um, and the whole thing is designed to extract that information back out. So if you keep a good training log and then you run these block reviews, you'll be able to see those types of patterns. Even if you're not using specifically this type of method, it'll take longer for those patterns to, to emerge, but you'll still be able to see them. Um, just running the block reviews on every training block that you run and then starting to develop that picture of, Hey, what do all the successful ones have in common? Man, every time I have good performances, it's after a block where I did, you know, medium intensity bench pressing, or maybe it's a certain exercise or a certain combination of exercises. But you start to form those pictures by being observant and paying attention to the things that you've done in training. Reactive training systems.